We are the hedonistic pong vatos. A profound thanks to the dead dog barn. We got a guest on stage, the incomparable Roger Predactor. And this song's about Roger. He's called Mama Get My Gun.
what's up? Hey everybody, I'm Roger B. Jackson back at the barn and we are doing another episode of Behind the Red Car and today we are really behind the red car back here at the stage because uh, there's a lot of shit going on in this place because we do a lot of stupid <laughs> shit around here. I'm with Scotty Two motherfucking hottie and motherfucking Renee with hedonistic punk vatos. Oh my god, we just had a blast. Oh fucking shit, tell us about us. What's going on? Well, we're looking for a bassist, somebody that's not a pussy, that wants to practice hard, get real fucking tight, that's going to show up to practice, put in some hours in, so when we're on stage, we throw it the fuck down. Yeah, we suffer from a lack of bass player disease. We're trying <laughs> to find one. We will. Now, now you guys, y'all had a bass player when we originally signed <laughs> you up for the gig, And I don't remember how long ago we did that, but then since something happened, I don't want to talk about your fella. I don't want to badmouth anybody. Nah, he but was just a cool guy. A, just give us a time frame of, like, how long was it going? Did y'all have a bass player? We felt good about it, and then all of a sudden, fuck, it's gone. We, uh, maybe like about two months ago, you know, we, we auditioned this guy, he was cool as fuck. We asked him, hey man, are you cool with like practicing hardcore? You know, like coming in every Saturday, just put in the time in. You know, when we practice, we drink beer and we barbecue and we practice and we jam out. And uh, he was cool with it. Uh, we did one gig at Mavericks in uh, Arlington. And then, uh, but later on, like, you know, it, I took a break in the middle, man. I, I got married and um, when Can I came start back- out noise. Okay. Congrats, motherfucker. Thanks, brother. Appreciate it. And then uh, when we when I came back, you know, uh, it was more like, hey, let's let's go to record. He had like a home studio. Let's go record. But um, that's where it kind of like kind of split off a little bit. Um, you know, like I said, the dude was cool as fuck. I still dig the dude, but his philosophy on recording was kind of like he didn't want any like real drums. And I kind of I've known this guy for uh, by at least ten plus years. I'm not gonna ask anybody not to play their instrument on any music that we're recording. And and that's where it kind of veered off a little bit. And I, I wish him well, man, you know. He, he moved on to a, another band and we're looking for somebody that's more that's gonna be like, you know, get on stage, jam the fuck out, and have a good time, man. That's all we do, we all have a good time. Amen. Everybody fucking digs us. And uh, th this is a badass band, uh, Chris Sativa, Sativa Kid. It's a badass band. We jam with a lot of people, and that's how we do it. I'll tell you, man, I, I, I dig what you're saying because this is a very unique drum kit. You're not going to go buy some bullshit $300 electric kit and duplicate all these drums. And, and, and plus, besides all that, forget any kind of monetary value. It's just if you're putting out a product, the product you record needs to be the product you deliver every night. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's like... I remember seeing bands and like their live sounds better than their CD. Yeah. And, you know, back then, your know, CDs, right? Yeah, people yeah. do this shit. On. And then there's other bands where their recorded stuff sounds better than they do live. And then it's like, to me, which one do I like better? You know, I, I want the real deal. I, I'm, I want the live deal, the CD deal to match up. We're a live band, man. Yeah. We're a live band, but we recorded some stuff and it sounds pretty good, but we're gonna be working on an album. We have like 30 plus songs. We just gotta get that last piece and just put it all together and there you go. Bass players seem really hard to find here in the um, uh, our area. Um, I, I know lots of people that are just lacking a bass player yeah. away from being a fucking band. Yeah, you, you got know? too many people saying like, hey man, I, I'll, I wanna join your band, but I have like three other bands. Like, we prefer somebody that's just in this band because I think that when you make music, you make better music when you're just focused on something cool as fuck. And that's pretty much it, man. Like, hey, man, it's all good. You know, we'll find somebody that fits our style. Well, there's a lot of guys that want to be in the band, you know, until it comes time to be in the band and all the work that goes with it. It's not all, you know, peaches and cream. There's a lot of work involved, a lot of rehearsal, a lot of sacrifice of your spare time and your girlfriend or significant other doesn't like that you know and you can't deal with it then that ends up suffering you know and it's just that's what we went through five bass players the last time we were here we've been trying to find someone that would would hook up with us and, and play and do what we need them to do Gentlemen, it's been real hard for the first time ever we have a caller would you like me to put the caller through 
Um, yeah, let's put the collars through. That's amazing. Okay, all right. There we go. Hi, guys. Um, first time, up time. I, I love Behind the Red Car. This is, this is the best show on the fucking internet. It's so cool. So thank you guys for doing Behind the Red Car. We love it so much. But I have a question, a couple of questions for the hedonistic Pompatos. First of all, you guys fucking rock. That shit is dope. Awesome. Call, um, where are you calling from? Does your mom know you're calling? I'm calling from Ennis, Texas. Um, do you have a mother? That's none of your goddamn business, um, sir. Okay. I don't see how that's relevant to myself. Anyway. Carry on. Fucking. Anyway. <laughs> so, guys, I have a question. So, Renee, I noticed you play a Gibson Les Paul style guitar, but it, if I'm correct, it has a maple neck. And that's pretty interesting. I'd like to know how you found that guitar. And uh, Mr. Sky Too High, boom, da, boom, boom, da, boom, da, boom, WWF Sky Too High. That shit's awesome. Anyway, uh, that's one hell of a gigantic fucking drum kit you have there. Um, what, how did you piece that together? So basically, how did you guys come to, to bond with your instruments? Where did you get them and how long have you had them? Go for it, brother. How did we get I'll start off. Um, when I was uh, when I was uh, 14 years old, I wanted I wanted an electric guitar, and uh, my parents had already bought my brother an acoustic. They paid a lot of money for it. And he hardly touched it, you know. So when it was my turn to get a guitar or ask for a guitar, I says I want a I want an electric guitar for Christmas. So I got this hundred hundred dollar guitar, no name brand, with a really badass PV Ray Jam that came with it, like the whole little kit, right? Under the Christmas tree, the best Christmas ever. And, um, you know, my dad told me, he goes, you know, my mom, my, my dad told me, he goes, hey, if you learn how to play that, maybe one day we'll get you a better guitar, but we want to see you actually like play it. You know, they're not going to invest any more money in an instrument that nobody's going to play. So, you know, I, I joined a band as a singer, but they made me the guitarist because I was the only one that owned the guitar. So I started playing and like about a couple few years later, you know, I was in high school and um, I was on track to be, you know, one of the top four students in the class. And at that point I was just like, what am I doing all this studying for, for nothing? I was skipping class, jacking around, you know, all that. And so um, one day, you know, when my parent, my, my mom and my grandmother and my sisters, you know, they were going to the mall, I would go because at the old mall in Harlington, Texas, there was a, a music store called Cherry John's Music. And Mr. Cherry John lived at that store. It was this little old man, but he was really cool, you know, the man. And, um, you know, every time my parents would go to the mall or something, I would just go, I'll be at the music store, come get me when y'all are done. And I would spend all my time there. So one day, I just happened to notice that he was talking to my mother and my grandmother. And then I, I go over there because it's time for them to pick me up. And he goes, you know, this was like, you know, this was uh, about a little bit before graduation, you know, 1990, December, around there. And um, he goes, young man, today's your lucky day. And, you know, back then they didn't have, they didn't have Epiphone. They didn't have any like other style guitars. All he had was Gibsons and Fenders, maybe a Kramer. And you know a couple of those, and and some uh, BC riches like the real stuff, right? And it was like a like two and a half stories long, and the whole wall was just full of guitars. And he goes, and he did the whole magical thing. He goes, son, today's your lucky day. He goes, pick any guitar you want, any guitar, and it's yours. And then he, like an old sage, he looked at me and he goes, he puts his hand on my shoulder and he goes, choose wisely. <laughs> it was awesome, man. So. You know how when you're a kid, you know, you say like, oh man, if I had the money, I'd get that guitar. They're all, these were all thousand dollar guitars, you know, and he goes, oh, if I was a kid, I would get that one and that one and that one. So I picked five guitars and it came down to two. It came down to a 1985 Gibson Invader and it came down to a signature Angus Young Black SG with a little switch at the bottom. It had a signature on the, on the headstock, you know. And, you know, he had set me up with a, with a half stack and, you know, it came down to those two. And I was jamming on them. And the best way I could describe it, the only way I could describe it is this. This is the floor. 
and the the distortion on that SG was right here and the distortion on the Gibson was right here but the acoustics on the SG were down here but the acoustics on this one was up here and so I I, I really dug you know Guns N' Roses had come out I really liked Izzy Stradlin and I just wanted to play acoustic electric with some heavy riffs and like you know go from evil to pretty and that's been my style since I was a kid like you know sometimes I switch on over when I'm jamming and um, that's the guitar I picked and it was the greatest day of my life and then after that you know my, my mom my grandmother told me it was like well that's your guitar and that's your graduation present so like now I had to study so I studied my ass off got my degree well I got my diploma and then I went to get my degree later and you know my grandmother got rest her soul and my mother have supported me ever since man I mean, I'm talking about you, you're jamming out in the backyard and my mom's inside making us avocado tacos, you know, like just, you know, bread and avocado, something for me and my band members and my brother putting tons of salt in it, you know, jacking around with our snacks. But you know what, man? <laughs> Greatest what times of my life, man. Good story. That's, that's a fucking amazing story, Ray. Thank you for telling it. Yes, I'm a caller still on the line. Yeah, your call screener sucks. So, Scotty. How about your drum set? That's a that's a pretty fucking amazing giant thing you got there. What how did that come about? Well, when I was twelve, my oldest sister was considerably low, older than me, and my mother got together and bought me a five-piece set of slinger lens. I don't know. To this day, my mom passed when I was seventeen, but to this day, I still can't get my oldest sister to tell me how she got the money or where it came from. We didn't have it, but we also lived in a mobile home park. You can see where this is going. So every day I come home from school and wail on them drums. And I have to apologize to all my neighbors for that 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 era of my life. But it was the agony. That's what I did. I didn't want to do anything else. I feel them drums. And my mom would sit in the next room and listen and come in there and encourage me to play. Even though at that stage in my life, I don't have anywhere near the skill I have now. And it was pretty bad. But then again... I wish to be better than I am now. I, I I don't want to be, you know, the greatest guy. I just want to be the guy that everybody goes, hey, he's okay. He plays good. That's all I want to do. And if I end up being the guy that's the greatest, that'd be okay too. But for now, I just want to play, make people happy, and I work my way up from five pieces to nine. And that's the biggest kid I've ever had, just nine pieces. What did run? Uh, well, I, I take that back. I had a 10 piece at one time, but it was two bass drums. And I got tired of lugging the other one around. There's enough crap to haul around as it is. So we just get the, I just have a double pedal. But it's, it's uh, just something I've always been, uh, how do you say it? Wanting to do it. You know, it, it, it's not. It was an aspiration. Yeah, and, and, it, and it's not like. Well, skill levels, I know guys that play circles around me, but they don't play. Yeah. They just, they don't care about it. Yeah. But I do, I care, I play. I'm, if I screw it up on stage, they give me funny looks, I don't care. I think it's an original song, so most people don't, I've never heard it, so they don't really know how it goes. Yeah. But that's the whole point, is to have a good so time. So are there commercial famous drummers that you idolize and like to play after? Well, when I was my mentor when I was a kid, he go. told me, he goes, Who do you want to play like? And I said, Gene Krupa, Neil Peary, Buddy Rich. And he goes, You can't play like them. And I'm going, I got mad. I said, Well, well I can play like anyone I want. And he says, You don't understand. He says, You are not them. Play what you hear. What do you hear in your head? Uh, I said, well, I hear this. He goes, and Play it. Well, it's not easy. It's not supposed to be. Play what you hear. Try, stop trying to copy everybody else and play what makes you original sound. It's not a fad, man. It's a way of life. Yeah, it you is. Know, it's a way of life. You know, like I remember, um, I remember asking this guy, and he came to audition. He was really cool, and he stuck. You know, he just nailed it really good. And he says, and I go, hey man, so what do you think, man? Do you think this is something you can do? It takes a commitment, you know, it's kind of like, you can't just say, hey, I'm not practicing, I got to go do a barbecue. We're like, no, I got to go to practice. That's what I say to my girl. That's what he says to his girl. It's it's not a fad, it's a way of life. Now, you guys ever fucking have any friends or anybody you ever thought about doing any kind of horns 
add some horns to your music? Shit, we can't even think about horns. We're looking for a bassist. I understand. You're looking for the bass. I yeah, and then the thing is, though, at one point, I mean, I'm not the best guitarist out there. Maybe I was thinking at one point, maybe we could get like a lead guitar or something. I switched to lead only because everybody else flaked out and we needed a lead. So I would play and then I'll switch over to leads or whatever. But I mean, I'm a rhythm guitarist since I was like 14. So I only started playing leads maybe a couple years ago and I do OK. But I mean, you know, but at, at the end of the day, it's like, you know, there's a lot of people with a lot of talent, but they're not really into it like we are you know we we fucking love to play man i mean shit dude it's you know i've i've you know and i'm gonna um be honest dude i've drank beers i've tried a bunch of shit i smoked a lot of stuff i tried this and that and i have never gone higher than i have when i get on stage and i play my shit i mean that's just the greatest feeling in the world i mean i, I don't smoke pot anymore i just drink booze it's only to bring me down a little bit because when you get off stage man i'm like hi dude and it's the best feeling in the world man i mean shit and i still have that guitar and you know this is my best friend don't ever get rid of that guitar yeah man oh dude that that guitar is going to the grave with me That's unless i have a kid you know but even then it's like if you don't play guitar i'm taking that with me to hell <laughs> kids are grateful pieces of crap take it with you yeah there you go never quit Never give up. No matter how bad it gets, no matter how it gets, no matter how bad the gig is going, just keep playing. Because honestly, your skill level is only matched by whether or not the crowd you're playing to likes it or not. If they don't like it, no matter how good you are, it won't change a darn thing. They now, won't. Now how is you gotta that? Entertain because, them. you know, I, I've been, okay, lately i got to say I haven't. But in the past, I've been to lots of different bars, and I prefer... The small local scene, way, way over, you know, fucking Aerosmith at Dos Equis, okay? Yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd rather go see a band at Trees or fucking, you know, yeah. something like that. You know, Mavericks what? is great with, like, live bands, original bands and shit. But Jerry I mean, Morgan's so now there. you guys, I mean, I'm, um, is it harder for you with a crowded floor or... Doesn't one or, matter. One or two people on the when, floor. When we play, like, oh, this is me, and and he feels the same way. When I play on stage, if, if there's like one person, two people, like 20, 30, 50 people, 100 people, like, I, I just feel that every time on stage, I have to play like it's my last day on earth, man. It's my, my last day on stage That's because good. you know what, man? Like, I find that when I like really push my vocals to like, and I've been working on them a lot, but when I really sing, like it's my last day on earth and I put it out there, man. When I'm done with my set, my shirt is like soaking wet. You can, yeah. you can squeeze it and like sweat comes out. But I feel that, but I also get goosebumps up my legs, you know? And I just feel that I have to give it everything I got if I'm ever gonna be good. And I mean, like I, I remember a long time ago, I walked, you know, had stopped playing guitar for a couple few years, you know, I just kind of put it down, you know? I moved over here from San Antonio, and it was a, quite a few years before I picked up the guitar again, like, in that sense. I walked into this bar, and I saw this band at a really cool bar, and they were playing a song that was, it was uh, the music from a, another song on the radio, I think it was, I hate this song, Kryptonite, right? But they put their own lyrics, and go, this is an original song, and they played the, the music to Kryptonite and their own lyrics, and I thought to myself, okay, fuck that. If these guys can get on this really cool little bar stage, I can do it too. So that's when I started the band. Hey. There you go, man. Okay, hey. I just heard in the news there was this um, artist, um, the red-headed kid. Um, Sheeran. She okay, I, 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 listen, I don't know music. I don't know any of his music, but I know who you're talking I about. I couldn't name a song of his if, if you fucking had yeah. a gun to my head. All right? But I heard that the... Um, Family or the estate of Marvin Green. That would be Marvin Gay. Marvin Green. Gay, Something like whatever. that. They were suing him, and he won. Yeah. And, and I'm like, you know what? I haven't heard his version of a song, but I'm happy for that because, you know, um, yeah. I, I just I don't I don't I don't. Know. Every everybody borrows from somebody. The the trick is to sound as original as possible, you know. And that's one of our things. If I write a song that I think sounds a lot like another song, I'll scrap it no matter how good it is. So 
Our whole goal is to sound as original as possible. Our goal is, is when you walk into the bar, and you see us on stage, that's what I thought for myself. If I walk into a bar and we're playing on stage, I would like to play good enough to where I personally, like my standards, I guess, where I would say, that's a badass band. I'm gonna order a beer, I'm gonna sit there, I'm gonna watch that whole set. So that's that's the goal. We're gonna play, if we want people to walk in and say, damn, that band's fucking good. We're gonna sit down, we're gonna order beers, and we're gonna watch the hedonistic poem of Athos. And so, and so we uh, try to do it to where one song doesn't sound like the next song. So that when you're talking to somebody, you're like, oh, that's the same song. No, our songs are different. And we try to do that. And, you know, people say, oh, it sounds a little bit like this. It sounds a little bit like that. But our goal is to sound as original as possible. It's rock and roll, man. I mean, shit. So you're it's all good. a gig, right? And, like, what's your ideal um, time for a set? You know, how, how long do you like to play? We like to play a lot, man. I mean, you know, the standard set everywhere is like 45 minutes. Yeah. And uh, we did a show a couple of years ago in at the Hop Shop in Hellingen, Texas. And we played two hours after all the other bands. We just kept playing. And the coolest shit on earth was, man, is like we're doing a, a like a ballad. And the coolest shit was, what was it? People were like... Waltz and they were dancing out there. It Coolest was, thing that was ever. One man. of the greatest moments in rock and roll I've ever experienced. Yeah. To see someone out there waltzing to rock and roll. Yeah. And it actually, they were in step with the music. Yeah. It, it was just pretty awesome. It was just, we have a lot of music. We can we can play 45 minutes. We can play an hour. We can play two hours. We as long as your music doesn't sound like the next song, we we mix it up. We our sets are like like a tempo wise doing like this, you know. It's not all heavy. It's not all low. It's like a good like mix, you know. It's not all in a. It's we change it up, you know. It, we 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 put a lot of thought into our set so that when you hear us, you're like, man, every song sounds different, and and you can just drink a beer and just hang out, man. That's that's how we want. We just want people to check us out, oh, dig right. us. So where can people you know? find you guys if they want to look for your music? Right here, man. Uh, well, by the way, I was gonna give you a sticker, dude. Uh, HedonisticPunkVatos.com. Dot com. There you go. And uh, we got videos there. We got um, profiles for each member. Um, every time we have a gig, I put it up on the website. It, it the date and the time, the address. It's uh, phone friendly, and um, we put a lot of pictures in it. I started a new little uh, little section for fans, so if, if somebody comes up to us and takes a selfie with us, we'll put it on. But it, it can't be a selfie of yours. So it has to be. We have to be at least a band member has to be in it. But like we put like videos in there, and so that's that's our hub. We're also on Facebook. Just hedonisticpunkvatos.com or hedonisticpunkvatos on Facebook and on social media. Um, Punk Vatos for Life on uh, on Twitter, um, and then we have our own individual like Instagram, uh, Richard Scott Hamilton, and mine is Rene Guitarista on Instagram and stuff. And I just gotta say, bro, before anything, dude, we love the Dead Dog Barn and Roger Productor and Ben Davis, man. This is the shit, dude. We've been looking forward to jamming with you guys like for weeks and months, man. And so, we're, thank you, man. I appreciate you so much. Saludos. We, awesome. We're entertained 100%. 100%. I love this place. Ah, man. So, um, I guess you guys got any, any shows lined up? Not right now. Um, okay. So you are just looking for the bass player. To well, I mean, out you know, here's the thing. One day I was here, and uh, when Dad did their show, and I was talking to Hank, and I go, "Hey man, let me ask you something. We we don't have a basis, but we're still doing shows. Let me ask you, what do you think? Should like you know? It was just like a musician asking another musician. Yeah, I go, we're still doing shows. What do you think? He goes, he goes, fucking keep doing shows. I go, yeah. And just to hear that, I'm like, yeah, you're right. So we still do shows. We just haven't done one in a while because, like I said, I've been busy and stuff. But I mean, we're still working on like the the music that we play today on this show. That's all new music. You know, we got heavy metal, honey. We got uh, suicide chopper. We got um, mama get my gun. And uh, we got a lot more new music coming up. And so we're just adding to it, adding to it. Well, 
Well, shit, man, I think we've had a pretty good day. Do some hanging out and uh, see what's up. And, uh, thank, thank you guys so brother. much for coming out. Thanks, bro. Thanks for having us, man. Fuck this rock on. Saludos. Song is called Suicide Chopper. This song's called Heavy Metal Honey. <laughs>
as you're walking right out the door Loving those lists and lands with fingertips All I want is some more Velvet tongue telling me no wrong Talks with a heart of gold Leave me insane, someone to check my brain I know that baby girl And oh honey, dancing all over my heart Bouncing all over my soul Heavy metal honey Dancing all over my heart Heavy metal honey I love that baby girl
my heart. 